And once again, I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar for tonight. We are delighted to have uh, Marky here with us to talk about uh, Juncos. But before we get there, I just want to thank everyone who's a member of Los Angeles Birders for being a member. Uh, your support helps us both emotionally and financially. And I mean that honestly. Um, it helps emotionally because Mark can be very delicate at times. And so this helps him kind of, you know, get over those trying periods. But financially, it helps support things like these webinars, local field ornithology projects, community science projects, uh, even helps us uh, pay the bills and keep the lights on and keep the website up. So please, please uh, give us your financial support. And we are starting our um, big push for the Los Angeles, uh, Los Angeles um, Burning Atlas, both breeding and non-breeding and non-breeding. So uh, that's uh, so we need seed money for that. So that's wonderful. Uh, thank you for your support. And with that, I'd like to introduce Desi, who will introduce our speaker for tonight. Desi? Thanks, Ron. Los Angeles Birders is very happy to have Marky Mutchler with us this evening. Marky earned her bachelor's degree from Louisiana State University, and this fall will be heading to the University of Chicago to pursue her graduate studies with the National Science Foundation Fellowship. Marky has been spending her gap years working on the Mexican Bird Resurvey Project that focuses on resurveying the birds of Mexico, see how both the distributions and genomes of Mexican birds have changed over the last 100 years. Marky has a strong interest and expertise in nocturnal flight calls, where she is considered one of the leading North American experts. She's also an avid and excellent birder. You may have seen her at Bear Divide early in the morning, counting and identifying birds as they dart overhead. Tonight, Marky will be discussing dark-eyed juncos, which are one of the most variable bird species in the United States and their identification can be very challenging. She will briefly discuss the long history of work that has been done to better understand its variation in the junco, as well, well as cover tips and tricks for identifying the various forms of juncos in more depth. So sit back and relax as Marky helps to unravel the mysteries of junco variation and boost your knowledge of these charming songbirds. Marky? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Desi. Uh, I'm very excited to be here and to talk about these fantastic little birds. So let me go ahead and share this. We all good? You can it looks, see looks the great. presentation. Awesome. Alrighty. So yeah, we'll be kind of looking into identifying and a little bit of understanding these various forms of dark-eyed junco. And so to start us off, what are juncos or what is a junco? Like what exactly is that referring to? Because other than dark-eyed junco, there are actually several species of junco. So to orient ourselves, let's kind of take a look at um, the New World Sparrows group. Um, this nice page here is actually um, something that you can find online through Birds of the World. And we notice in New World Sparrows, our friendly familiar uh, LBJs, little brown jobs, we have the junco genus right here. Um, and so juncos are actually five species. And so we have the dark-eyed junco that we're all pretty familiar with and what I'll be talking about more in depth throughout this presentation. We have Guadalupe junco, we have the yellow-eyed junco, the Baird's junco, and the volcano junco. And so when looking at these, if we kind of give a nice little glance over, we notice that all of them have a pretty similar body shape, body plan. Um, some of them have more reddish brown, some of them have colors on their sides. Um, some of them have yellow eyes and some of them have dark eyes. And so when we are looking at our dark-eyed junco, um, we kind of notice that this image right here is featuring one of the many types of dark-eyed junco, um, one that we may not be as familiar with uh, here in Los Angeles. But let's go ahead and orient ourselves on these five juncos. So here, oh, here is the range of these New World Sparrows or juncos. They are found, of course, throughout North and Central America. 
And uh, this map, if we briefly look at the colors, if you're not familiar with these maps, orange is kind of a breeding range, blue is wintering, and purple is year round. So um, a lot of juncos breed outside of that red range as well. And those are our five junco species that are still up here. And if we go ahead and move them to where they are kind of found, um, we'll notice that again now, um, there's all these different jungles that are just found within the continent of North America. At the very bottom, we have the volcano junco in Costa Rica. Then we have the yellow-eyed junco, which is found throughout Mexico, uh, Mexico and into Guatemala. We then have the bear's junco that is found on the southern tip of uh, the Baja Peninsula. We have Guadalupe junco, which is found on, the, found on the island of Guadalupe off the northwest coast of Mexico. And then finally, the rest of the United States and Canada is the dark-eyed junco. Um, and so with the dark-eyed junco, it's kind of like, oh, all these other juncos are found in these little tiny ranges and they look kind of different. So why is the dark-eyed junco this massive range where they breed in the Rockies, they breed up in Canada, they breed in the Appalachians, and they winter all across the United States, and yet it's kind of this one species. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about species in a bit. So let's go ahead and focus in on dark-eyed juncos. Um, if you were to look up a photo of dark-eyed junco online, if you were to type it in Google, go to eBird, type in dark-eyed junco and look at images, you might get something that looks like this. And you're thinking, well, the images that we've seen of dark-eyed junco so far is this gray and white bird. Um, but again, if you have seen juncos down here in Los Angeles, you may be more familiar with the ones with the kind of dark head and the orangish sides and orange back. Um, and so if we think about it, well, we just saw a bunch of juncos with dark heads, orange backs, orange sides that are different species. And if we think in the broader sense, they're sparrows. And we all know that sparrows are these brown little birds that often small differences separate them and make them completely different species. So why is this entire image here all one species? Um, and how do we categorize all these different things and all these different plumage types? And the way that we can do that is through um, subspecies. And so the reason why they're subspecies and not species, again, that's a bit of a philosophical question that we will tackle here in a little bit. Um, but these six groups uh, of these different phenotypes or basically what the plumage looks like in these juncos, um, these physical differences, we have things with white wing bars, such as the top left bird here, that's the white wing junco. We have the top right bird that the last couple images of dark eyed junco has been this subspecies, which is the slate colored junco. Below that, we may have a very familiar face, the Oregon junco. And below that, we have the pink sided junco. And then the last two that are kind of these gray with the reddish backs are our red back junco and gray headed junco. And so um, Desi kind of mentioned that dark eyed juncos are one of the most um, various birds in North America. And you're thinking, well, okay, maybe if I know a little bit about subspecies, there are quite a few species in North America with six subspecies, um, but actually these are subspecies groups because within each subspecies, there are a myriad of other actually described subspecies. So we're just gonna focus on the six because these six groups are pretty good at describing the overall variation of all the subspecies that are under them. Um, and we'll be referring to them by their kind of common names that I kind of went through with like white wing junco and Oregon junco. So again, let's now dive into this topic on subspecies versus species versus how do we quantify all this variation happening with juncos? Well, a paper actually recently tackled um, these questions and they created this lovely map. Um, it's a bit of a busy map, but it's a very informational map. Um, basically, all the different colors on the map itself are the different breeding ranges of all the different juncos, including both subspecies and different species of juncos, if you recall the five species we talked about earlier. Um, so in the United States and Canada, we have all the different subspecies of dark-eyed junco. In Mexico and the rest of Central America, um, we have things like the bird's junco, the yellow-eyed junco, volcano junco, um, some of those familiar names that we just recently talked about. This paper, which is um, called the Rapid Postglacial um, Diversification Long-Term Stasis in the Songbird genus Junco, 
Um, and they use something called phylogeographic and phylogenomic um, data to create this evidence for that rapid post-glacial diversification. And so you might be thinking, okay, I just read that title and that was a lot of words at once and some of them I may not be very familiar with. And so um, to kind of walk through this title, let's start with something that maybe we have already a little bit talked about, which is the genus Junko. Um, and so we have songbird genus Junko that includes those five species that we talked about in addition to um, all these different subspecies, which are in dark-eyed Junko. Um, and they are songbirds, so they're related to other things like warblers, titmice, which are passerine birds. But that's a little bit more than you need to know. So let's see, let's go to the next thing, phylogeographic and phylogenomic evidence. For the purpose of this talk, um, if you remove that phylo in front, we have geographic and genomic evidence, which may be a little bit more clear as to what we're getting at. So we have geographic evidence, which is looking at where these birds range, where um, they're breeding, where they're wintering. And that's kind of what this map is showing here, which is very nice. And genomic evidence is getting at comparing the bird's DNA. And so by looking at DNA differences, we can parse out things such as how closely or distantly related these birds are, how often they might be interbreeding and hybridizing, or how often they're not hybridizing. Um, and so that evidence can help us kind of parse out the final part of this title, which is really that rapid post-glacial diversification part. Um, and this rapid post-glacial diversification is one getting at, we think about rapid diversification, we look at this map here, we see all this crazy variation, um, which can be um, chopped up to diversification. But that rapid post-glacial part is getting at the fact that um, the continent of North America has gone through several cycles of glaciation. Um, so through warming and cooling, glaciers have um, extended further south and retreated further north. And that post-glacial is getting at that kind of retreat from a glacial maxima or this like very large extent of glaciers. And so as they have um, receded, Junkos have actually been able to move north. And as they move north, they're encountering these different habitats, these different environmental niches, and they are subsequently gaining differences in both their DNA and also this kind of plumage. Um, and so that's what this rapid post-glacial diversification part um, is getting at with the songbird genus Junko, and that geographic and genomic evidence is supporting that. The long-term stasis part is more so referring to the fact in terms of evolutionary history. These birds move north with glaciers. We don't have any glaciers anymore um, that are extending further south. There are still some glaciers left, um, but those glaciers are not um, in, like extending into a very large part of the continent. And so that stasis getting at the fact that the glaciers are pretty much gone, the juncos are here, and the juncos have not changed that much. Um, they've rapidly diversified and suddenly now they're kind of like in this stasis where we're not seeing a ton of a ton of change over the last few thousand years. And so again, this map is sort of that geographic scale. Let's kind of dive into that genomic scale a little bit. And so we use um, something called a phylogeny um, or a tree. And this is looking at the DNA, comparing DNA of our juncos. And so on the right hand side of this figure that has popped up, we have all the juncos um, that were displayed on the map and they have their four letter code. So for example, at the very top we have SCJU, which is slate color junco. And then at the bottom we have something like VOJ, which is volcano junco. And so these are just four letter codes that follow something very similar to what we would use um, often with birding or banding birds. Um, and it's just those uh, two letters from the, the beginning and two letters from the beginning of the end word. To understand this tree a little bit better, um, the next thing we can kind of look at is it's got this like, kind of like if you've never read a phylogeny before, you're noticing it's just kind of like these weird like boxy rectangles as they go. Um, and each of the sort of like edges um, are referred to as branches and where they kind of form the vertical part and they sort of split apart um, are these branching events. And so that's just where the DNA has sort of diverged. Um, and each of those points are where the last common ancestor um, for that kind of like the next Junko's over onto the right um, last was. 
And so finally, at the bottom of this tree, we have this time scale in millions of years. And I just kind of want to point out that for, in terms of um, evolution in birds and what we consider species, uh, one million years is usually a good enough amount of time for deciding that something is uh, a different species from another bird if we compare their DNA. So let's kind of walk through this tree. Let's start at the very left. And as we move right, we'll kind of talk about what is happening. So we're all the way over here um, a little bit longer than 1 million years ago. And we have this nice split with this very long branch on the very bottom that leads to Volcano Junko. So we can see the Volcano Junkos over here and all the other Junkos um, are split out from Volcano Junko. Um, and Volcano Junko, it kind of makes sense on the map. They're endemic to Costa Rica. They're in the highlands of the Talamanga Mountains and they're found nowhere else. And they look very different too. So it makes a lot of sense that they're kind of like this uh, most diverged Junko. If we follow the top branch over, the next sort of split happens um, between a quarter and a half million years ago. Um, and that is between the Baird's Junko, which is found at the southern tip of Baja, and then the rest of the juncos, including things like Guadalupe junco and yellow-eyed junco and our dark-eyed juncos. Um, as you may notice, the next branch on the very top is much shorter than that first branch that we followed. Um, and this is sort of honing in on that rapid diversification, the more of these like splitting or branching events that were happening as we go in time period uh, is happening more and more frequently. And that kind of keys into this rapid diversification. Oops. So, we have this next split um, at around a quarter million years ago. And uh, we'll notice it's between yellow-eyed junco, dark-eyed junco, et cetera, and then this Guatemalan junco and the Guadalupe junco. Um, and so uh, we'll come back to the Guatemalan and, Gua uh, Guatemalan and Guadalupe juncos a little bit. But let's kind of focus in on what's happening up here. And you may notice this big blue bar that's um, across all of these little branches. And so all these little things, all these like little tiny horizontal lines look like little tiny like half rectangles. At the end of each of those is corresponding to a DNA sample. Um, and each of these uh, little bars um, for those little samples could be like, this. this tree could have like, 10 slate colored dark eyed juncos, 10 Oregon dark eyed juncos. So not all of these are a different subspecies of junco, um, but rather several samples across a range to try and like get a good sampling of what an Oregon junco is or what a slate colored junco is. But you may notice why is yellow eyed junco included with the dark eyed junco here? And you'll notice that the split was like pretty recent um, between these in terms of evolutionary history down here. Um, and so this is where we start getting into what is a species when we're looking at genomic data, why is it that we know yellow juncos as birders are a different species right now? Like you can count them on eBird and you'll get a different species than dark eyed junco. Um, and actually, if we look at what is considered a species right now, that doesn't really line up with this um, genomic or DNA built tree. Um, we'll notice the things like the Guatemalan junco down here, which is a bird found in Guatemala, um, is, or I guess, yeah, it's in Guatemala and it's like, why is it not its own species? Why is it, it's actually considered a subspecies of another species of junco. And things like this junco that's found in Chiapas, it splits out, but it's not its own species. And yet something that has not diversified for very long and is very closely related to our dark-eyed junco, the yellow-eyed junco, um, is its own species. So this is its own situation. There's a lot of arguments that arise from these types of things. Um, and well, what is and isn't a species is up for debate. Um, it's an incredibly tricky topic and there are so many other things to consider other than just this genomic data. Um, and towards the end of the talk, I will get a little bit into some of these other reasons as well. So that's sort of an introduction to this rapid diversification and looking at it from a DNA perspective and then also this kind of like orientation into the geography. 
And with research, of course, if we were to go on the Google Scholar and search up Dark Eye Junko, we had almost 10,000 results. So there has been a lot of work done with Dark Eye Junkos. Um, and this ranges from metabolism work to hormonal work to looking at migration and um, microstructures. There's so many things you can study and there are so many more questions that we're asking, many that we have not been able to answer yet, especially looking at speciation. And so um, even in a well-studied bird like the dark-eyed junco, there's still so much to learn. And in fact, actually, a lot of the Oregon juncos that breed down here in Los Angeles and San Diego have only started doing that recently. Usually they're a montane breeder, um, but there are now projects looking at why we have this sudden incursion of dark-eyed juncos that really like to hang out um, in the basin at lower elevations. So Again, that's kind of a background on dark-eyed juncos and juncos in general, speciation, geography, all that good stuff. But let's go ahead and get into the nitty-gritty of identifying these different subspecies, those kind of like six groups that we talked about of dark-eyed junco. Um, right here we have a nice little pink-sided junco that's greeting us as we start and dive into these subspecies. So let's start with a familiar face, the Oregon junco. And just to kind of give you a light a layout here, um, on the left hand side of the screen, we have adult birds. And on the right hand side for Oregon Junko, we have young birds that are within their first year. On the left again, we have adult male and then an adult female below that. And on the right hand side, we have an adult, uh, sorry, not an adult, a young uh, male Oregon Junko. And then below that, a young female Oregon Junko. So, Again, these are probably very familiar. Um, these are probably, when you think of dark-eyed junco, this is probably the one that comes to mind for many of you. And right away, kind of the thing that jumps out is their dark hood. And so they have kind of this like dark head, dark chest that's really contrasting and like de uh, demarcated from the rest of the body. Um, and this is kind of what we're referring to as a hood. You'll also notice um, that the border between that hood and like its sides and its belly is really sharp. Um, it's really easy to see where that hood starts and stops. Um, and one more thing I'll point out is the shape of that hood. It's very rounded on the chest um, or convex. The next thing that we kind of look at when we're working with Oregon junco and the rest of the juncos and comparing the subspecies is to look at the side color. And so in Oregon juncos, for the most part, um, they have this orangey or buffy side color. And another thing that I'll kind of note, point out, um, other than the color, is the kind of quality of what the sides look like. Um, if you look at all these juncos, they kind of have like fluffy or diffuse um, feathers that are throughout here. And you'll notice that the side, like while it is a different color than the white on the belly, it's a different, it's not very much of a different shade. And so the contrast between that white belly and those pinky orange buff sides is not very sharp. Um, it's kind of like those feathers blend into one another a little bit. And so that's a pretty important mark to pay attention to when you're trying to tell us from potentially a rarer subspecies of dark-eyed junco that may be visiting your backyard. One thing I'll point out is um, the brown on top of the head here. This is not an identification mark for any one subspecies. Uh, this is simply a mark to show um, what young birds look like. A lot of young birds will have brown from the back all the way up on top of the head. And in general, will just be more brown overall. Um, and their quality feathers might be a little bit less than what you'd expect in an adult bird. So the next uh, subspecies we will kind of briefly go over is the pink-sided junco, which overall is pretty similar in appearance to the dark-eyed junco um, and can often be a tricky bird to tell apart from um, some subspecies of Oregon junco. Uh, and again, we have on the left here an adult male and then an adult female junco below that. And on the right, we don't have um, young birds, but we do have um, a little bit of a different view on the pink-sided junco to hit at some pointers um, that will help you identify if the rare junco in New York is a pink-sided junco. So first, I want to point out Oregon junco. We notice that really dark hood. Pink-sided junco, they also have a big hood on them. Um, it's actually more extensive, extends further down the breast than Oregon junco. 
but you may be noticing one that hood is not dark it's not contrasting it's not black in the adult male it's not this like even in adult female organ juncos that hood color can be a little bit different um the other thing i'll point out is that organ junco the contrast between the sides and the belly and the back was like really nice um and it was like a really nice rounded shape on many pink-sided juncos this hood shape um may be a little bit it may be pretty solidly demarcated from the sides but honestly it can get pretty messy the gray feathers can mix them with the white feathers can mix them with the pinkish feathers on their side that they're named for um and it doesn't form nearly as nice of this like very rounded shape um so again it's more messy it's more extensive and um, it's a lighter gray color. The next thing that we can point out about pink sided juncos before we dive into their pink sides is the dark spot in front of their eyes. A couple other subspecies do show this dark spot, um, but especially when telling from Oregon juncos, pink sided juncos have this very like it's super contrast, it's so dark, and the transition from that dark into the light gray hood is very sharp. Um, and then finally, with their pink sides, let's look at where those pink sides come together to meet on the breast. From a front view, um, oftentimes the pink sided juncos, pinkish sides can almost connect or even overlap. Um, and so if you see the bird on the left, this pink is like, I guess you could call it pink. Um, it's sort of a, a brownish orangey color, um, actually comes underneath that grayish hood and connects fully. And you have none of this like separation at all. And on the right, you have a more extreme case of a pink sided junco um, where there's that white extending up and touching the gray of the hood a little bit. Um, but oftentimes that pink is very close. And I'll have a few examples later, but the Oregon juncos, this pinkish or orange colored sides never meet. So the next subspecies we will talk about are the slate colored and white wing juncos. And these are um, in general, more Eastern subspecies. Uh, so the white wing junco is found in the Dakotas during its breeding season. And the slate colored junco is found in um, Boreal Canada during its breeding season. However, both of these, when they um, go into their wintering grounds and they leave their breeding areas, they disperse widely and are found across pretty much the entire United States. White winged juncos are a little bit more restricted to the interior, um, like the Rocky Mountains, but oftentimes you can get strays um, both east and west. So let's start with the slate colored junco. That's that eastern junco. Um, so if you're from the east and you grew up with slate colored juncos, if you thought of dark eyed junco, that might have been what jumped to mind for you instead of the Oregon juncos that are found here. And these guys, they kind of look like if you took a little bird. And it was east, it was like right before Easter, and you're dipping your eggs and you accidentally dipped your bird figurine in kind of this like grayish color um, and left their bellies nice and white. Um, they don't have, you may be noticing, they don't have any hood. They don't have very much brown on them. Um, and that is a pretty great way to tell these guys apart from just about every other subspecies of dark eyed junco. So again, they have no hood, like none of that very nice like separation between the sides and the head it all blends together they don't have like a convex shape that sticks down onto the breast and their backs are pretty gray um you may be noticing here on the adult female that's on the bottom she has some brown on her back some brown on her wings um, but that's to be expected for slate colored juncos one thing i will note is um these two here are young slate colored juncos which are very brown um, the brown extends onto the heads, the backs, the sides, um, and it can get kind of confusing pretty fast because some slate colored juncos can look almost hooded when they have brown sides, a brown back, but a more gray head. Um, so you always want to watch out to make sure that a slate colored junco is not passing as a young female Oregon junco. Um, and again, all dark eyed juncos in their first years will have kind of like more brown coloration overall. Next, let's talk about the white wing junco, which looks very similar to the slate colored junco. Um, and again, these guys breed in the Dakotas, mostly in um, kind of like the Badlands area. Um, and they look kind of like that slate colored junco, but you may be noticing this top bird in this photo has some white wing bars that it is so aptly named for. Um, and you may be thinking, well, that bottom bird 
doesn't have white wing bars. So how do I identify that from a slate colored junco that's gray on top and white on bottom as well? Um, I will say most white wing juncos do have white wing bars. Um, some of them are more faint, some of them are more bold. And usually you would see this plumage without the white wing bars in like midsummer, which is great because the chances of you having a vagrant white wing junco in your yard in summer is next to none. So you don't really have to worry about them too much. But the best way to identify white wing juncos is by their long silvery and oftentimes pretty large bills. All the other junco subspecies, except for one, uh, have pink bills that are kind of short and stubby, whereas these guys have kind of these like silly longer bills that are really silvery color. Sometimes they're a little bit pink tinged, but they're almost always the silvery color. And sometimes they even lap, lack the uh, dark tip to the bill. The other thing is overall that gray color on their backs and sides and head um, is really light color. So if we look back at slate color Junko real quick, um, the female, yes, she's a lighter gray, but the male is a really like dark slate color where the female is kind of this lighter, warmer toned gray. So again, paying attention to the gray color is really important. The next thing we will cover are the last two of our subspecies for dark gray junco, and that is gray-headed and red-backed juncos. So on the screen, I have both of those subspecies, and you may be thinking, well, they both have gray heads and they both have red backs. So how do I identify these? Um, and just as an introduction, both of these birds are in the Southwestern United States um, with red backed being in like Arizona, New Mexico and gray headed throughout the, the Southern Rocky Mountains up to like Wyoming-ish. Um, just to orient yourselves, here are the labels for them. Red backed is on the left, which again is Arizona um, and gray headed is on the right, which is something you may encounter in Colorado if you visit. And the best way to tell these guys apart is by paying attention to not their backs, not really their heads, but instead their bills and their throats. Um, and so the red back junco will have a pink based bill, but the top part of their bill or their upper mandible um, will be the kind of this grayish slate color. So I mentioned that white winged juncos are the only ones with that uh, silvery bill. Redbacks do have a different color. However, um, it is more pink based in general, but they always have at least some gray on the top bill. The other thing that they have is they also have a paler throat than the gray headed junco. Um, but if uh, that can be a little bit harder to tell apart, especially if you don't have something to compare to. On gray headed junco, the best way is to look at um, that bill color once again. They have a nice pink bill and they will have dark on the tip of the bill, but they will never have dark extending on top of the bill. Um, so that's something to always make sure to watch out for when uh, telling these two apart, especially where they overlap. So let's go ahead and recap our six subspecies in terms of kind of the ID marks that we want to follow along with. So let's start off. Does the junco have a hood? Does or doesn't, what color is that hood if it does have it? And what shape is that hood? Um, so here's some examples of what we kind of look at. So on the left, we have a slate colored dark red junco with no hood, a gray head, a gray chest. And the chest is actually that gray between the white is kind of um, a concave where the white sticks up and forms a rounded edge the other way. Um, in the middle, we have a Oregon Junko, um, and you will notice it has a very nice dark hood and the dark sticks down the other way. So it's more convex shape of a hood. You'll also notice that the hood is um, very dark and not exactly a cool gray color, but it is a little bit of a more brownish dark slate color, but that's kind of hard to tell. And then on the right, we have a bird that has a gray hood. It's a light gray hood, um, but then we notice as the gray extends down on the chest, which extends pretty far down, but it's like mixing in so much with the other colors that are going on with its body. And this is a pink sided junco. So again, does it have a hood? Yes or no, is there, and by does it have a hood, we're referring to again, is the color of the head um, demarcated from the back and the sides of the belly. Um, and again, 
if we look at the slate color junko, that's not happening. The sides are the same color as the chest, as the same color as the head. Next, we're going to look at the color of the sides of the bird. And we'll think about, are these sides um, more of a solid color that contrasts with that white belly? Are they more fluffy and kind of mix into the belly color, which is white? Um, or do the side color patches um, that, do they like meet across the breast or are they more separated? So here's the first step, looking at the colors. Are they diffuse? Or are they more solid? On the left, we have a bird with a gray side and a white belly. And you can kind of notice that gray is mixing in with the white. It looks kind of fluffy. Um, that is a slate colored junko once again. The middle bird has a nice orange buffy side that's also pretty buffy. Um, and it mixes in kind of with that white. So there's no real sharp line. Sometimes um, this subspecies will have a sharper line, but they still look pretty kind of fluffy. That's an Oregon junco. And then finally on the right, we have this really nice like deeper pink color and it looks really solid. It's like the feathers aren't as fluffy. They're like all more one color and they more sharply contrast with the white belly. There's more of a line happening there. Um, and that is the pink side of junco. To get that other view of like um, where this, the colors on the side meet or not, we can get a view that looks something like this. So on the left, we have no hood, we have gray sides. We don't really have um, a shape of the hood. Like there's no hood to make a shape there. So the gray sides all just come across together. Um, again, slate color junk on the left here. In the middle, we have a gray hood that extends down, a nice white belly. And we can see that these orange sides um, come up on either side of that gray hood but they're not coming anywhere close to one another. There's no touching. The white on the belly fully touches the gray hood and keeps those kind of orange buff sides apart. And then finally on the right, um, we have the white belly, the gray hood, but we have the pink sides touching on the breast. And that's what a pink sided junco looks like. Um, and again, the middle is an Oregon junco, so you can kind of see how all that white extends up pretty far. Um, and this is a really great way to tell them apart um, because oftentimes pink sided junco is a one that's most typical to show up that looks very similar to Oregon junco. And when you get female birds, it can be kind of tricky. But if you can get that head on shot, that's a great way to combine your other field marks to confirm pink sided or Oregon junco. Finally, another important thing to look at is that color of the gray. Is it more of a warm brown? Is it light colored? Is it dark colored? What's going on? Are we how, how are how are these different shades looking? And I will point out um, one thing to be aware of is lighting can affect how um, the color gray appears. And often photos, depending on your white balance, if you haven't set the white balance or if you edit your photo and the white balance changes, that color of gray can start to look cold or um, more brown. So it's very important to pay attention to this in the field. Um, or to try and make sure that your photos are really matching um, what you're seeing. And so some examples of those different colors of brown um, and gray. You know, on the left, we have a very warm, um, as some artists might call like French gray. Um, it is a lighter gray and there's a lot of brown mixed in, but the actual gray parts like the side of the head that's there or the parts of the wings that are gray, it's a very warm and light gray. In the middle, we have a very dark and cool gray. It's kind of bluish. And but yeah, what I bet I mean by cool is that blue um, kind of color uh, interspersed into this more grayish color. And then finally, we have another very cool gray, um, but it's very light. And you might be noticing that the wing bars are present on this bird. So that is a white wing junco that you're seeing there. So again, we have these ID marks to really focus on. And um, you can kind of work through almost like a dichotomous key style of like, let me check its hood. Does it have one? Does it not? What color and shape is it if it has one? Okay, let me look at the sides. Are the sides this color? Are they meeting on the chest? Are they staying to the side? Um, if you like have a junco that you're curious about, make sure you get kind of like those front photos and those side views so you can really compare those things. And then finally, something that you can also add to these marks um, is what color is the gray? Is it more cold? Is it brown? Um, 
And then finally, when you're identifying these juncos, you can throw in those other marks that kind of single out different species, like the bill color, um, whether the upper mandible is gray on things like a red back junco, um, or if you're looking at something that might be a white wing junco, you can look at um, the silvery bill. Or if you're like, man, I really think this is a pink sided junco, um, maybe it has the really dark spots in front of the eye. So that's the recap on those ID marks to work through those six groups for the dark eyed junco. Um, but one more thing, it's not that straightforward. It never is, right? Um, so you recall this map from the beginning, and these are those breeding ranges of those different dark eyed junco subspecies. And we've talked about Oregon junco, pink sided junco, gray headed, red backed, white wing, slate color junco. And you'll notice that um, these different subspecies groups come into contact in many places um, across the Rockies, especially. And where they come into contact, we get hybrids. Um, yes, if you were like, great, I've got this down, I can tell the juncos apart, I think it'll be good. There is a little wrench that's thrown into this. Um, a lot of these juncos can look rather intermediate from one another. And so um, to kind of briefly walk through uh, kind of the main phenotypes or how the bird appears, um, we'll kind of jump through each of those. But I will also mention a caveat that these are just one photo of what these hybrids look like in the most like typical situation, but you can get many variations um, in these hybrids, which makes it so much more fun, but also so much more tricky. So to start off, we'll just briefly talk about up here in the Northwest, um, we get the slate colored junco and the Oregon junco hybridizing. So you get this junco with a dark gray hood, but the rest of its body is also gray. Um, some birds can look like an Oregon junco that has no brown. So they just have this like beautiful hood with gray sides. Some of them look more like this, where it's like, they kind of have a hood, but the breast is really messy and it goes into the sides. Um, that's referred to as a Cassie R. Junco or Cis Montanus. Um, but you can find it on eBird, they actually made a whole category for it, which is very nice. The next bird we'll kind of look at briefly is a pink sided Junco from the Dakotas is, uh, I'm sorry, the pink sided Junco from like Wyoming and Montana, hybridizing with the white wing Junco of the Dakotas. Looks like a pink sided Junco has white wing bars, <laughs> which it's actually very beautiful. Next, we have pink sided junco once again, now hybridizing with um, the gray headed juncos of the Rockies. So you have a pink sided junco with a red back. Another one that we can look at is pink sided junco and Oregon junco, which are already so hard to tell apart. And honestly, the hybrids are pretty intermediate. They often have a slightly darker hood and maybe reduced sides, those pink sides. But honestly, that is an identification that is very, very tricky. Um, and not very many of them have been made confidently. Another one is Oregon Junco hybridizing with gray headed Junco. So you get an Oregon Junco with a red back and diffuse gray sides. And then finally, this last bird down here um, is hybrids between red back Juncos and yellow eyed Juncos. And so if we kind of recall all the way back to the beginning, Yellow eyed juncos right now are considered their own species. You can go down to southeastern Arizona and see yellow eyed juncos, and it's a new bird to your list. Um, and dark eyed juncos, if you've seen them here and you see the dark eyed juncos in Arizona, they're going to be the same species. Um, but if you also recall that um, DNA tree showed that yellow eyed juncos are very closely related to um, dark eyed juncos. And in this case, that makes sense. So you can kind of see that this bird looks very much like um, the red back junco with the silvery bill, the red back, the gray body, but it has a red eye. And that's because yellow eyed juncos have yellow eyes and dark eyed juncos have very dark brown eyes. And so when you mix those two together, you get this sort of ambery red colored eye. So once again, that just calls into this whole thing of why are yellow eyed juncos a species, why are dark eyed juncos with all this differentiation not different species, um, why are sparrows that have very minute differences completely different species, and here with juncos with big differences we don't have different species, 
Um, and once again, it's just a big mess. This hybridization portion where all these different subspecies can interbreed, um, especially breaks down the argument for species um, separation. But once again, it's very tricky, it's very messy, and um, yeah, dark eyed juncos are great. However, one more thing, I promise, and this will either be, I have to include it because um, as kind of briefly mentioned, I love flight calls. Dark eyed juncos do have different flight calls. Um, it's not something that has been really studied in depth. And I wouldn't recommend using flight calls to identify with confidence, um, but there is some slight variation. So these are spectrograms. The red bar is just kind of a marker in terms of um, the frequency. And so frequency is kind of like, is it low? Is it a lower sound? Is it a higher sound? Um, and you can kind of see that a lot of these flight calls, which is if you ever hear like a junko fly away, it kind of goes like tick, 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 tick. Um, that's what these calls are. Um, and you'll kind of notice, especially with like the white wing junco down here on the bottom left, those calls are closer to that red line, which means they're lower in pitch. But once again, this has not been studied very much in depth. I just thought it was something kind of cool because sometimes when I'm in the field, I notice I'll like hear a junco and I'm like, oh, like that sounds different than the junkos I've been hearing otherwise. And I might follow it and it might end up being like a gray headed junco. Um, so there is something there with potential differences in flight calls. But otherwise, most of um, study that has gone into looking at spectrograms has gone into song. So don't worry, you don't have to use these to identify them. I just thought it was something cool to include. Um, but once again, here's kind of that recap on those ID marks to kind of triangulate to um, something if you're trying to identify some really cool junk that you see and you're like, oh, that one looks very different. What is that? Um, especially in winter, you never know what can show up. And so with that, um, I thank you all so much for being here and listening to me talk about these really great birds. Um, it's so wonderful that they breed like right outside my door, um, which again, I mentioned is kind of a new thing, which is really cool. Um, but with that, I'll take any questions. Fantastic. I really enjoy that. If you have questions, please put them into the Q&A uh down on your uh below your screen and uh marky thank you very much that was a wonderful wonderful program i thank you uh, so much your students are going to be so lucky to have you as the <laughs> as their prof i will also say if you can't think of any questions now and you're thinking about them I will be on the pelagic coming up, so. Ah, okay. <laughs> ah yes. Think about a dark eye junko question. There we go. We can, ask. yeah, talk about juncos at the front of the boat. Yeah, yeah, pelagic junkos. <laughs> <Or not> see, <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, <clears throat> we have a, a question. How frequent is hybridization in the overlap areas? So between the different subspecies, it's variable. Um, I would say, for example, with that slate colored and Oregon junco up in like British Columbia, that is pretty common. Um, so my, my parents live in Missouri and in the winter in Missouri, I might see three or four different subspecies at my feeders. Um, but I will say with each year, I feel like I see a, a pretty large jump in the number of these hybrid Oregon slate colored juncos in my yard. Um, and so usually I'll have maybe like 15 to 20 slate color juncos, five or six Oregon juncos, and then I might have like five or six of these Cassie R juncos. Um, hmm. So I'd say with those, there's a pretty regular um, number of those that are happening. The other hybrids, I would say it kind of depends. The biggest limiting factor is the fact that um, sometimes these subspecies are so remarkably similar where they hybridize that actually being able to tell which ones are hybrids and which ones are not um, can limit the numbers that are actually being detected. So especially where things hybridize and then they hybridize again and then they hybridize again, you might have genetic hybrids, but the plumage may look like one parent or the other. Mm -hmm. Cool. Great, thank you. Um, Lily asks, do you think that the subspecies could eventually become separate species? 
I think um, there's definitely a possibility. So that paper that I mentioned talks about the sort of long-term stasis. And that's where, again, these birds um, followed as the glaciers receded. They occupied these different niches and environments. And ever since then, they've kind of stayed the same. And there's been this sort of like balance happening. Um, and I think it's possible that um, thousands of years from now, that they could um, maybe continue those things and maybe you have more birds that are more choosy about the plumages and the songs that they're hearing or seeing and so maybe white-winged juncos are like nope I don't even like birds with any pink on them I don't want to mate with a pink-sided junco and suddenly you have this sort of isolation happening or maybe something happens environmentally where suddenly they are physically isolated and they no longer can't even come into contact so there's always the possibility for that great be, be interesting to go get in a time machine and <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> find out after a few thousand years um so tom asks uh to what extent can slate colored and cassier juncos be distinguished in the field or ask another way how much plumage overlap is there yeah so um it can be tricky because uh so again where i have a lot of experience with cassiar juncos again for those who may not have caught the what Cassiar are, are, are those hybrids between slate colored and Oregon juncos. And so Cassiar juncos can look almost any range from an Oregon junco to a slate colored junco. And those ones on the fringes are really tricky. But I would say the most I notice are like adult male birds. And so what they look like is they usually have a very dark hood. And then their sides are completely gray. There's no orange, there's no brown in them. They have completely gray sides, um, but their back might be like brownish. Um, so you can get birds that have a very like distinct rounded hood. You can get birds that have a very distinct um, difference between the dark of the head and the brown of the back, but the front might be like a slate color junco where it's just gray that blends all the way through. Um, and then you can also get female birds that look Kind of like um, first year female Oregon juncos, where they have the brown from the back extending all the way up the head. But the difference between that grayish hood and the brownish sides on the Oregon for a Cassie R might be a little bit more blurry. So you can get Cassie R juncos that look very, very similar to um, these female Oregon juncos. The biggest mystery of it all, however, is that. Yes, Cassiar junco has been described as this hybrid between slate colored and Oregon juncos. However, the amount of reported Cassiar juncos, no one has sampled those to see if they're actually hybrids. So <laughs> we're basing it on the fact that, oh, it kind of looks like the mix between the two. <laughs> but the ones that show up in my yard that I call Cassiar, they may not be hybrids. They may just be crazy variation in Oregon or slate colored juncos. Hmm. Hmm. Well, <laughs> if that makes that was, you like yeah. i don't know if that is inspiring or worse <laughs> oh my gosh i can't even tell i don't know <laughs> it can be inspiring in the fact there's many questions to still be answered yeah like, yeah somebody yeah, needs absolutely. to get up there and start banding them and <laughs> and and taking dna samples and so on definitely um great um so Alicia asks, are, what are some thoughts about why we've been seeing juncos around town in recent years? I didn't see them when I was little, but now they hang out in Pasadena all the time now. Yeah, so um, I kind of briefly mentioned this. Um, Oregon juncos used to only breed in the mountains. Um, they were never down like Los Angeles breeding or in San Diego breeding. Um, sometimes they were in here in winter, but they leave for the summer, they go back up to the mountains. However, in the last several years, as you've kind of mentioned, um, they started sticking around. They stick around down here in the cities and they have been breeding and doing just great. There's actually um, a whole project dedicated to this through UCLA. Um, this image actually here of me holding a Junko, recently we banded some Junkos on campus with UCLA here at Occidental College um, and they're studying um, how these birds are breeding and like how many offspring they're having, how successful they are, their survival rates, um, because it is this like really new thing that's really cool. Like suddenly this montane bird that breeds in 
forests is now hanging out in gardens and breeding under ferns and grass tufts. Mm -hmm. um, and this project is trying to actively figure out why they're doing that. Some thoughts are, so this UCLA project, there's also a project called the Junko Project, which is great and has a lot of informational videos. Um, they think that it's possible that while these birds winter down here, maybe in like February before the birds head up back to the mountains, the males start singing um, and they may still go up to the mountains to breed, but they their hormones um, have allowed them to start singing and getting ready to go defend territories. And this might actually trigger the females to then suddenly start producing hormones um, mm -hmm. to start building nests and laying eggs. And so rather than being like, oh, I need to wait another month to go up and build a nest and lay eggs, the males are singing now, I need to breed here. Um, and so uh, that's one of the thoughts behind why the juncos have started breeding here is maybe there's been a shift in when male juncos start singing. Interesting. Hmm. That's cool. Um, let's see, we have another question by Pete. Why does one hybrid um, get its own name, Cassier, and the four other ones don't get their own name? <laughs> so um, this is because of that fact that we don't actually know if what we've described as Cassiar Junko are hybrids. Um, and so it gets called Cassiar. Actually, tech, I mentioned on eBird you can report Cassiar Junkos. It's actually reported as slate color slash Sismontanus for Cassiar Junko. And this is because when Cassiar Junko or Sismontanus was originally described, this guy, he was like, oh yes, this looks like a hybrid. So I'm gonna describe it as this <laughs> Sismontanus thing. Um, and then no one has actually looked at, was that actually a hybrid? We don't know, it was just this phenotype that he described. So they get this funky name Cassiar um, because we don't actually know if they're, of what we're describing as Cassiar are actually hybrids. I think they definitely do hybridize and I think there may have been, or at least active research that's looking at the hybrid specifically, but no one is like, during wintering range, we have this massive amount of birds that look like intermediates. No one's going and like sampling those and seeing, yes, they have um, hybrid genomic data too. So that's why they get their fun little name because we don't actually know if they're hybrids. Hmm. That's cool. And another future project, especially <laughs> the, all the, the young birders who are watching something that they can. <laughs> Uh, they could eventually work on. Um, another question for nocturnal flight calls on the spectrogram. The Oregon junco has one peak and the other, other subspecies have more than one peak. Does that mean that the Oregon junco has only one syllable compared to the others? Yeah. Um, these were just uh, calls that I pulled off of Macaulay really quickly. There's actually not that many recordings of their flight calls, which is a little bit sad. Um, I will say these calls, they they give them during the day. I actually have heard them give calls at night, but I don't know if they're migrating. Um, obviously, they do migrate, especially in the eastern United States. Um, they migrate here in a smaller distance, but they still move. So you could still get them at night. Um, but the one versus two versus the other was simply just the recording. Um, so if you were to go and see a Junko tomorrow and it flies away from you and it calls, it might give like, an outburst like a tit, 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 like as it flies away or am I just like go tit, tit 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 and like fly away and so one versus two versus many um I honestly don't know if there's any difference between the subspecies um maybe there is something that's happening there but for that example that was just to show the shape of the call rather than a number of calls great and so another thing people can do is record the juncos that you see <laughs> yes and that you, yes that you definitely mm-hmm yeah, because everyone records phone. the songs, and the songs are different between them in general. Um, but the flight calls, no one has really looked at that yet. Mm -hmm. Another project. <laughs> yeah, another, yet, another, yet another project. This is great. We, we have we're, we're rapidly approaching 10,000 papers, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so Gregory asks, I'm assuming this is really hard to study, but what's up with Guadalupe being most closely related to Guatemala and not bears, which is way closer? Is there anything known about that? Yeah, um, so I mentioned briefly the Junko project. I think they actually have a page that's like the ordinary extraordinary Junko. Um, and they have a whole project with like these great videos that you can watch. And they they kind of tackle that a little bit where they mention like, 
why is the Guadalupe Junco on Guadalupe Island? Um, <laughs> closely related to something that's like all the way down in Guatemala um, when we have the Juncos in Baja and the Juncos in Northern Mexico. Um, and I don't think they've quite parsed that out yet, but I'm guessing it has something to do with like the last common ancestor of them maybe being like a Junco that was found like very widespread across Mexico. And as time has gone on, like that, that like widespread Junco jumped over to Guadalupe. And then through um, different periods in the earth's like cycle of warming and heating, those environments quickly shrunk where Juncos could actually live. And so the, the Juncos that evolved from that last common ancestor that may have been really widely distributed have now make up the uh, Juncos we see today. So it's possible that we had this like very wide range across a lot of environments that allowed a lot of Juncos to disperse to this incredibly remote island. Um, and then through changes in um, the Earth's atmosphere or even just physical environment and geography, um, the Juncos have suddenly restricted. And now um, the only ones that were able to like hang out live down in Guatemala. But that's a really rough um, yeah. sort of perspective and it seems kind of crazy. It's like, how would that even work? Like, maybe that's what's happening. But I know that that's a question that a lot of people have when they see that tree. You're like, why is an island bird related to a bird in Guatemala? So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Alvaro has a question. Uh, back when I was in school, Volcano Junco was not, was just speciating around then. <laughs> <laughs> a million years I, ago. <laughs> yeah. Okay. They're not that old. Um, I measured about 200 Junco skeletons. Then I did a multivariate analysis of sort, which ones are most similar. Oddly enough, white-winged junco um, was an outlier closest to gray-headed. Volcano was the very different one. Major difference was size component, but, but the secondary component had white wing closest to gray-headed. Obviously, skeletons don't tell you phylogeny, but my question is, are we mistakenly thinking white wing is just a slate colored with white wings? Is it perhaps a gray-headed without red on the back and white wings? Any thoughts? <laughs> Um, I think that's a very good, uh, like astute observation with that because we are so observation based. We're like, oh, it's got to be the most easiest, like, or <laughs> as a lot of like cladistics would call parsimonious, um, is why not just put white wing bars on a bird that already looks kind of like that? Um, why would we need to make like a couple more changes for another bird to make that? And I honestly think it does make more sense that the white winged juncos may be um, like a gray headed junco. They have that lighter gray color. Um, they have the darker lores. And then um, they're also very close to the Rockies. So it would honestly would make more sense to me in that way. Um, I think in terms of just describing how to identify birds, it was just a little bit easier to be like, it's like a slate colored junco, but has <laughs> white wing bars um, in terms of just how we think in very like a birder sense. Um, but I think in terms of an evolutionary sense, I think that's a really good um, path to think with, uh, to take with thinking about these questions um, because not often is the most parsimonious or most like limited number of changes uh, always the right answer, especially in morphology. Morphology used to be very based on most parsimonious um, tree built on morphology in comparison. So it's like, oh yes, the white wing junco would be more closely related to the slate color in terms of number of plumage changes you need to make to go from one to the other. But that again, is not always the case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, interesting to think about. Um, Julie asks, how different is the diet between different juncos? Ooh. You know, I don't know too much about their different diets. Um, I mean, they are sparrows, so they eat a lot of similar um, groups of things, whether that's seeds or insects. But I imagine, um, depending on where they're at, the variability of the things that are available to them um, can be quite different. And we actually do see difference in bill shape um, and bill size in these different groups of juncos. Um, like Guadalupe junco has a very different bill. And white wing junco, we kind of saw, has that weirdly larger bill and the color is a little bit different. If you know much about yellow eyed juncos, they have a completely different colored bill and some of their subspecies have different like um, bill depths or like how like 
basically just like the dimensions of the bill can be quite different. And so I think that probably ties into um, what they eat, which would make sense. You need a bill to eat and forage. The other thing that bill can also tie into is the bird's song actually, and how that song is communicated and how it sounds when it comes out of their mouth. So um, I personally do not know their exact diets and how much they are um, different between one another, but it could be another project. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> that takes oh. us up to 1,050. <laughs> exactly. Right. So we have a, a whole a whole research program um, that's been outlined on this this webinar. So, you know, good thing that we have this all recorded. Absolutely. <laughs> I lost track around 800 or so. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Marky, this was a wonderful program. Oh, I'm sorry. Not, oh, no, I take it back. This was a wonderful program. Everyone enjoyed it. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> and uh, yeah. go ahead, Frank. Yeah, you really gave a great, <clears throat> a great discussion of that paper, too. I thought that was really good mm -hmm. to uh, walk, walk people through that. I think it's really, uh, really very helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I want to wish Marky and everyone a happy, a happy summer solstice tomorrow. And, and um, everyone, all the members have received uh, a ballot link in, uh, in their email. Please go ahead and submit your ballot, whether you vote or uh, abstain, abstain from voting. Either way, please submit your ballot. And if you're watching this during the last week, in June 2023, go ahead, please uh, submit your ballot. And with that, is there anything else, Mark? No, I don't think there's anything else. Just thank you so much, Marky, and um, you know, good luck in 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 Chicago. We will certainly miss you here. Yes, good luck in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Chicago is going to get a great uh, a great uh, ornithologist uh, out of you, and so something we're <laughs> going to miss. And join us on the Pelagic upcoming. Yes, Pelagic. yes, yeah. yes. And join us on the Pelagic. Yeah, Marky's going to be there, um, and she'll answer all your junko <laughs> all questions. Your, yeah, we're talking about <laughs> Pelagic juncos. Yeah. We can ponder how a, a junko got to Guadalupe Island. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, must have been a Pelagic ancestor. Yeah. yeah ship <laughs> Anyways, good night. Uh, good night. Well, let me before I good night. Let me just make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah, um, that lots of thank yous um, in the chat. And with that, good night, everyone. I hope you all have good a night. wonderful. See you on the boat. So yes, good night. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks again. Enjoy the talk. Bye. Thank you guys. Thank you. Good night, everyone. <laughs>